Um, can I welcome members to the 25th uh, meeting in 2017 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, David Torrance has submitted his apologies and I'd like to welcome Colin Beattie to his first meeting. Um, in accordance with Section 3 of the Code of Conduct, can I invite Colin Beattie to declare any interests relevant to the remit of the committee? Thank you, Convener. Delighted to be here and uh, I would just direct members to my d uh, interests that I've got on record declared. Thank you, Colin. Uh, agenda item two, decision on taking business in private. It's proposed the committee takes item seven in private. This item is consideration of the evidence heard from the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills on the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill. Does the committee agree to take item seven in private? Okay. So we move on to agenda item three, Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill. Um, so that the item uh, is to consider that. The committee's role uh, in scrutinising this bill is to consider the delegated powers in new sections 26B and 40B to be inserted into the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014. Those sections impose a duty on the Scottish ministers to issue a code of practice about the sharing of information under the 2014 Act. The bill is the Scottish Government's response to the judgment of the Supreme Court in the case of the Christian Institute and others versus the Lord Advocate, which held that the information sharing provisions of the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 in relation to named persons are incompatible with the rights of children, young people and parents under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights the right to respect for private and family life. The committee's role is to consider the delegated powers in the bill, specifically whether the correct balance has been struck between what is set out on the face of the bill and what will be addressed in the code of practice and whether the appropriate level of parliamentary scrutiny is provided for in respect of the code. So can I welcome the Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills to the meeting uh, and his officials, Ellen Burt, Bill Team Leader, and John Patterson, Divisional Solicitor. Um, I don't know if you had any opening statements you wanted to make? Yeah, I don't have an opening statement. We're very happy to answer the committee's questions. Okay. In that case, uh, we will move straight to questions. Um, so I'll start off. Um, could you explain why the Scottish Government is confident the new bill addresses the concerns of the Supreme Court when that does not appear uh, to be a view widely shared by legal witnesses who presented evidence to the Education Committee? Uh, I take that view based on the fact that we have considered in great depth the analysis that uh, the state judgment that was made by the Supreme Court and have focused on very specifically the issues that the Supreme Court uh, came to a conclusion about, uh, as you have just narrated them to the committee. And the conclusions of the Supreme Court were, um, were very clear that the information sharing provisions within the Children and Young People's Act 2014 were incompatible with the uh, with Article 8 of the ECHR, we had to identify how directly we could address that and how we could address the issues raised by the Supreme Court in relation to the provision of clarity around the interaction between the terms of the Children and Young Peoples Act 2014 and other legal instruments that are, of course, relevant in this respect. Um, so we have given that careful consideration. Um, obviously, I... Uh, I'm aware of the, the views and the comments that are expressed by a variety of parties on this point, but in my view and the view of the uh, consideration I've given to this question, we fully and adequately address the issues raised by the Supreme Court in this respect. And yet the Faculty of Advocates said that some of the criticisms of the Supreme Court will continue to apply if the bill as drafted is passed. Are they, are they wrong? Uh, well, I disagree with the Faculty of Advocates, yes. Uh, 
I'll come back in with uh, other questions, but I'll move to other members of the committee. Uh, Monica Lennon. Thank you, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I'm interested to, to hear from you um, in what way the bill seeks to respond to the Supreme Court's concerns about the lack of clarity surrounding the rules on information sharing under the 2014 Act and how they will interact with wider data protection legislation? There are essentially um, two critical elements of our response to the Supreme Court judgment. The first is to put into law the, um, the duty to consider um, the arguments and issues relevant to the sharing of information and the circumstances in which that may be permissible. And what the Supreme Court said was that we had not adequately set out in accordance with law in the 2014 guidance um, exactly how that, the, the 2014 legislation, exactly how that um, interaction would take place. So we've established within the, uh, the bill that duty to consider the question of information sharing. We've also addressed the Supreme Court's judgment by applying the approach of establishing a code of practice, a binding code of practice, which is there to inform individuals who will be in a position to exercise these responsibilities. Um, so that code of practice is designed to address the conclusions of the Supreme Court that the arrangements that we had made previously were not in accordance with law, in, in the words of the Supreme Court. So the code of practice will be obligatory. Um, it will be uh, binding on any individual exercising these responsibilities. So we give the interaction between the existing legislation and uh, the wider field of legislation that exists in this respect, um, that clarity that was sought by the Supreme Court in the judgment they arrived at. Thank you for, for your answer. Um, I think it's fair to say that a consistent factor in the complications around the in-person legislation has been the, the uncertainty and the worry over what the duty to share information means in practice for professionals, i.e. for health visitors and for teachers who will have to carry out the name person scheme. Um, on that basis, then, I'm still not really understanding why the government um, have chosen not to address the issue of consent on the face of the bill. I, mean, I know you've said to, to the convener you don't agree, Cabinet Secretary, with the Faculty of Advocates. Um, but I think the Faculty of Advocates have been quite clear that um, a code of practice is not a substitute for, for legislation and that if there's any conflict between the statute and the code of practice, it would be the statute that would prevail. So given the, the, the massive concerns, um, you know, I, I just don't really understand why the government are not putting it on the face of the bill. The, I, think, I think there's a, a really important distinction here about what is the purpose of a bill and what is the purpose of a code of practice. The purpose of a bill is to make law. The purpose of a code of practice as envisaged here is to explain the legal framework and the legal issues. Now I'm not proposing to change the issues in relation to consent, so I have no reason to change the law. And I don't propose in the bill to change the law because I have no desire to change the issue of consent. What I accept is that the Supreme Court has placed an obligation on us to explain the interaction between the existing legal framework and the legal framework that will be in place here, which will be the duty to consider information sharing. And that is um, precisely why I have taken the decisions I have taken about what is in primary legislation and what is in a code of practice. And do you have a view on some of the comments that have been made about the code of practice? Um, you know, it, it needs to be accessible and, and in clear language. Do, do you have any sympathy with what the Faculty of Advocates say around that? I, I certainly, I, I accept that the code of practice has got to be uh, able to be navigated by individuals. Now, I've, I've put forward 
um, an illustrative code of practice, because I thought it would be helpful to the parliamentary process to have sight of that at the time the bill is being considered by Parliament. Now, obviously, there is a... Um, we've got to get the sequence of events correct here. We're considering a bill. There will then be a separate consideration of a code of practice. But what I wanted to do was to try to be helpful to Parliament to see an illustration of what a code of practice would look like. Um, I'm not for a moment sitting here saying that's the last word on it. Um, there will have to be um, consideration about the accessibility of that code of practice. If we haven't got um, all of that detail uh, precisely correct at this stage, then I, I'm very happy to continue to look at that. And as I say, should Parliament agree to the bill that is before Parliament, there is then a separate process that comes forward to consider the contents of the Code of Practice, which would involve further dialogue with Parliament and with other stakeholders in that respect. Sure, and I think other colleagues want to, to ask about the role of Parliament in terms of scrutiny. Um, just to go back to the concerns of the Supreme Court, um, can you explain to the committee how the, B, the bill seeks to respond to, to the concerns about the lack of safeguards in terms of the consideration of consent? Uh, th that is essentially addressed by the contents of the, the bill, which contains uh, the duty to consider the question of information sharing, um, which bring, uh, and also the requirement to follow a code of practice. And the purpose of all of that is to ensure that a proportionate approach is taken to the consideration of issues in relation to the question of information sharing as would be faced by any professional or practitioner active in this area. Thanks for now, convener. Alison Harris. Yes, good morning. I just really want to continue along the code of practice route, just, you know, because given that the Supreme Court's focus is on clarity in terms of when information may be shared, you know, I still don't understand why the government did not choose to specify in the face of the bill that the code of practice must include an explanation of the relevant law on data sharing with, uh, with which practitioners must comply with when they are actually sharing information. Well, I think, I think the, the question that Alison has, has, has asked me essentially an, uh, answers itself, um, where the purpose of law is not, the purpose of a bill is not to explain the law. It is to specify the law, and there's a fundamental difference between the specification of the law and the explanation of the law. So the bill specifies the law, and the code of practice explains the interaction of the law uh, as proposed in this bill and other legal instruments and, and statutes. Now, of course, the code of practice, because it is called for by the law, has you know, essentially has the force of statute behind it. It has to be followed. It has to be, um, it has to be addressed by those who are taking these decisions. So what I've put into the bill are the elements of the, the law that I propose to change. And what's gone into the code of practice is the material to explain the interaction between this law and the Children and Young People's Act and wider legal frameworks that I do not propose to change. So, from what you're saying, am I correct in saying that the users have to really look at the code of practice in order to decipher, you know, in order to be able to operate the bill? I just don't understand why it wouldn't have been more clear, you know, to have it all included as one, because from what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong with my understanding, but are you basically telling me now that teachers really require somewhat of a legal degree in order to read the code of practice before they implement the bill? Um, no, I, I, I don't think that would be uh, what I'm saying at all. Uh, what, I'm, what I responded to Monica Lennon, her, her last question to me, was about the accessibility of the code. Uh, so that code has got to be accessible. It's got to be accessible to practitioners and professionals. And I'm absolutely committed to making sure that's the case. Um, which is why I've put in place the, which is why I've put in front of Parliament an illustrative code of practice to um, to give Parliament a sense of what might be there. 
and to gather feedback and reaction about the issues that we need to address to make sure that it is an accessible code. Uh, so, in that respect, it is, it is vital that individuals find that um, code of practice to be, um, uh, to be uh, of use and of value in that respect. Okay, thank you. So, given the Supreme Court's focus on the need for safeguards, specifically in terms of consideration of consent, why did the government choose not to include on the face of the bill a specific duty on in information holders to consider whether the consent of the child or parent should be sought before information is shared? And then, why does the government consider it appropriate to address the issue of consent in the code of practice instead of on the face of the bill? Because I still come back to, would it not be clearer for people to follow and understand if it was actually written in the bill? For the simple reason that I'm not proposing to change the arrangements around consent. And the question of, so that's why it's not on the face of the bill. Uh, because I come back to my fundamental point that the purpose of law is to specify the law, not to explain it. So if I'm not changing the law, there is no requirement to specify that in the legislation. And the code of practice um, will provide for safeguards applicable for the provision of information uh, under this part of the bill. And that, um, carries, and that will be specified within the bill, that requirement on the code of practice uh, to ensure that the necessary safeguards um, are observed by any practitioner in this respect. Okay, thank you. Have you only published an illustrative code of practice which might bear little resemblance to the real thing? Um, rather than uh, the, the actual code of practice, which could be properly scrutinised? Well, because we've got to get events in the right order. I don't have um, legal power to issue the final code of practice because Parliament hasn't approved this bill, which contains the legislative empowerment of such a process. What I decided to do in preparing this bill was to try to be as helpful as I could to Parliament by providing the, the bill, which obviously I, I have to provide, and all the associated documentation, but also providing an illustrative code of practice to give Parliament a sense of what might be in the document. Now, there is no formal process associated with that illustrative code of practice at this time because the legal force does not exist to uh, to adopt that code of practice. Um, so once I hear the views of individuals, um, stakeholders, members of parliament, and committees of parliament during this process, um, I will then be able to reflect on the illustrative code of practice, which is essentially our first attempt at putting this together, um, and then submit to parliament, assuming that parliament approves this bill, the code of practice that would be the subject of the consultation and dialogue that is expected of the bill. Okay. Stuart. Uh, thank you. Um, good afternoon, um, Cabinet Secretary. Um, why does the government consider that the process of parliamentary scrutiny of the code set out in the bill is akin to the affirmative procedure, given that there is no formal requirement for the parliament to approve the final version of the code before it's issued? as there would be for an affirmative procedure? Essentially because the route that I propose provides an opportunity for extensive dialogue with Parliament around the contents and the substance of the Code of Practice. And I obviously will have to take account of the, the views and the points and the, and the issues raised by Parliament as part of that process. So the, the bill puts a requirement on me to take account of any comments that are expressed by Parliament on the draft code. And that's actually a greater obligation than is carried by the affirmative procedure on ministers, where Parliament is essentially given the choice to either accept or reject. Whereas what the approach that I've taken here 
um, is designed to ensure that I can subject the code of practice to detailed parliamentary scrutiny, can then take away that parliamentary scrutiny and consider the contents of it um, before moving to the finalisation of a code of practice uh, to be applied in terms of the bill. Government's delegated powers memorandum notes that the, the code of practice is an important document and it goes on to explain that a, a detailed level of parliamentary scrutiny is appropriate given the binding nature of the code and the significance of the code to the named person service. In light of this and given the importance of the code in responding to the concerns expressed by the Supreme Court, does the government consider that it, it would be more appropriate to actually make the code a subject to the affirmative procedure for parliamentary scrutiny. What would concern me about that is that Parliament's interaction would only be to accept or reject the code of practice. Whereas what I'm trying to do is to create a mechanism that is appropriate for deeper parliamentary interaction about the terms of the code of practice. So I want to be able to produce a mechanism that will enable Parliament to reflect uh, closely and carefully on the contents of the proposed code of practice and then for me to be able to address those as the Bill places a duty on me to do so um, as part of the process. So I'm actually taking this approach because I want Parliament to be more deeply involved in the question rather than quite simply a take it or leave it question which is the conclusion of the affirmative procedure. So just for clarity then, uh, the, the, the process that you're undertaking is to actually allow for a, a greater level of, um, of feedback and, uh, and suggestions from members and committees um, that, that you would then consider uh, when uh, producing the, uh, the, final, uh, the final code to go into Parliament. In Second. short, yes. The, the, the Bill requires me to undertake a public consultation on the Bill. Uh, the Bill would require me to consult with Parliament and it requires me to take account of any of the comments expressed by Parliament on the Code. So I actually think that represents a greater sense of interaction with Parliament on the detail and the substance of the Code, which... Um, will then be reflected in the consideration that I give to the final contents of the Code of Conduct. So I'm trying to recognise the importance of attracting uh, wider confidence around the contents of the Code of Conduct. And I think the mechanism that I've set out uh, is of assistance in, in, in undertaking that task. Thank you. So the, the, the issue here is that this code of practice will, you, you will merely consider comments. There appears to be no mechanism where, where the Parliament can make amendments to this, make changes to it. It's all in your hands, is that correct? The, ultimately, the final design of the code of conduct would be at my decision making, but in, trying, in getting to that point, I'm going through an exhaustive level of consultation with the public and with Parliament to gain the widest understanding of the issues of concern and to maximise the accessibility of the code that Monica Lennon raised with me. So the, the measures that I will uh, put in place will be the product of an extensive amount of discussion and dialogue with Parliament and the consideration that I have given to the issues that have been raised. ...for Parliament to change that code of practice? There would be... Well, if we look at this in terms of a... If we look at this as a statutory instrument, there would only be available to Parliament the ability to accept or reject it. Parliament can't amend statutory instruments. So what I'm trying to do is to find a means of taking forward as engaged a dialogue as I possibly can do with Parliament to arrive at what will be a helpful um, design 
of a code of conduct that can deliver on the expectations envisaged within the bill? Practice, not a code of conduct. It could have practiced. Yeah. But we're still not getting to the point where Parliament, MSPs, can, can actually change this very, very important code of practice. The code of practice is, um, as I've explained already, is about setting into context existing legal provisions and weaving them together with the contents of the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014 and the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill. Um, it is an explanatory document. Um, it's an explanatory document that creates, that is binding in its nature, but it doesn't create any um, new law. It explains to practitioners the basis of interaction around the content of existing law. And for that reason, I think the route that I have set out is appropriate because I'm trying to maximise the degree of engagement with Parliament rather than simply saying, here is a code of practice which Parliament can either accept or reject and has no meaningful interaction in formulating. I just want to read you out a, a, a couple of quotes um, from ev evidence from the Faculty of Advocates. Um, they say, first of all, it should be remembered that code of practice is not a substitute for legislation. A code is not debated and passed by the Parliament. Where there is any conflict between the statute and the code of practice, the statute will prevail. Um, they go on to say, the issue of informing a child or young person or parent, that information is to be shared and the issue of obtaining that person's consent are discussed within the code of practice, but are not mentioned within the bill itself. In our view, these issues are sufficiently fundamental to be referred to within the legislation itself rather than simply being dealt with in the Code of Practice. The Law Society of Scotland say, we support the creation of a Code of Practice, setting out clarifications and guidance on the operation of the information sharing provisions of the Bill. However, the key safeguards and information should be contained within the Bill itself and subjected to full parliamentary scrutiny. Now, you know, these are the top legal bodies in Scotland, and they're saying that this code of practice should be subject to full parliamentary scrutiny. In other words, giving MSPs the ability to amend it. Is that not, is that, surely that's something you could consider? The provisions of the, the bill and the approach that I'm taking provides the opportunity for members of parliament to consider the contents of the uh, code of practice and to provide a mechanism for ministers to um, give further consideration to those issues that have arised out of uh, that have arisen from parliament's views being expressed but fundamentally this issue comes back to the material that is going to be in the code of, of, of practice. And the material in the code of practice is explanatory information. It is information to set out the interaction between different legal instruments. It is not creating any new or different legal instruments. And that's where I disagree with the point of view put forward by the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society. Because I think, and I'm surprised by their views, because the purpose of statute is to define the law. And I am very clearly making steps to change the law in certain respects. But I am not taking steps to change the law in relation to consent, which was one of the issues that was raised by um, one of the, the bodies uh, to which you referred, convener. Uh, so therefore, I, I, I consider the code of practice approach to be the most appropriate to um, explain that material to practitioners. Now, what I've tried to do in the bill is to put in place the means by which uh, 
we can have extensive dialogue around the contents of the code of practice in a way that can be more effective, um, that can represent deeper engagement than I could do under a statutory instrument where Parliament would be would not have the ability to amend it. Parliament would simply have the opportunity to accept it or to reject it. So I'm trying to create as interactive an approach as I possibly can do to enable me to take account of the views of Parliament in this um, important area of activity. Okay, I, I, I don't want to hog this, but I have to, I've got to press you on this. You've used this phrase, extensive dialogue. Now, can we get to a, you know, can we, can we get to a point where you agree that MSPs, Parliament, as, as part of that extensive dialogue, as you describe it, can have the ability to change this code of practice? Uh, that's not in the proposal that I have before Parliament to today. No, but could it be? Well, I'll, I'll obviously reflect on anything no. that a committee says to me, but my proposal is not to do that. Okay. Any other committee members? Colin, do you want? Yeah. Um, Cabinet Secretary, just uh, continuing to look at the scrutiny of the code. Um, given the code is not subject to any formal scrutiny process beyond the 40-day laying requirement and the requirement to take account of any comments expressed by the Parliament within that period, can you explain why the Government chose not to frame the code as subordinate legislation? For the simple reason that subordinate legislation creates new law and the contents of the code of practice will not create new law. There are examples where subordinate legislation has been used as a vehicle for bringing a code of practice into, into force. For example, the letting agent code of practice. Um, why is this code different? For the simple reason that the code of practice that I'm proposing will be an explanatory uh, document which sets out the, um, the ways in which the the bill interacts with other legal instruments, and as a consequence of that, it is not creating any new legal provisions. Any other members? I'll just ask you another. So, given the circumstances and background to the bill, and the concerns expressed by the Supreme Court, does the government consider that there could be merit in applying an enhanced form of affirmative procedure to the bill, which would allow the Parliament an opportunity both to shape and to approve the code before it's issued? Well, I've been mindful of the Supreme Court's judgment when I came to the conclusions that I came to around um, the code of practice and what the Supreme Court said at paragraph 81 of its judgment was that the court can look not only at formal legislation, but also at published official guidance and codes of conduct when determining the proportionality of any uh, interference with Article 8 rights. And at paragraph 107, the Supreme Court identified that a number of approaches could be adopted, including the provision of binding guidance, which is exactly the advice that I've followed in bringing forward the provisions that I have brought forward. And in addition to that, the Supreme Court um, reference a, a particular case involving the Metropolitan Police and their operating procedures, which in the judgment of the Supreme Court provided adequate safeguards in respect of proportionality, which is exactly the framework that we have used within the bill. So the measures that I've taken have been designed to create as much opportunity as I possibly can do for Parliament to interact around the formulation of the code of practice and for it then to have the status which is envisaged within the legislation um, and have the effect that we want it to have uh, in the form of binding guidance.
Any other members? Yes. Ken, um, Cabinet Secretary, I was quite struck by your earlier answer to Stuart McMillan, and um, I felt quite reassured when you said that um, you want you know, Parliament to have a, a deep involvement in this. Um, I, I still feel unsure about why the government um, are choosing not to address the issues around consent on the face of the bill, because that would give Parliament the fullest involvement possible. Um, again, can you just try and explain to me why that, that has been dismissed? It's purely and simply because I'm not changing the legislative provisions around consent. So if I was changing the, con the arrangements around consent, I would have to put that into, in, into primary legislation, and I'm not doing that. But the issues around um, consent are so fundamental to the operation of the law. Shouldn't they be on the face of the bill? But they're on the face of other legislation. They're specified by other um, uh, uh, instruments of legislation around data protection, around um, uh, the rules around confidentiality, and I do not propose to change them. What I propose to do is explain in a code of practice the interrelationship between this legislation and those existing parts of the law, which I do not intend to change. Can I just finish by asking then, you know, in the face of some very serious stakeholders saying that there's a better way of doing this, can you explain why the Scottish Government is so confident that this is the correct approach? Um, I, I don't follow the rationale of some of what's been put to the committee by other stakeholders because I don't intend to change the law on consent. Now, I suppose there is, um, well, it's for, it's for you know, other stakeholders to explain their position, but as I don't propose to change the law on consent, then I don't, you know, I have no reason to put that on the face of the bill. Uh, but what I do have an obligation to do is to address the issues that arise out of the Supreme Court's consideration and one of their issues was about the um the the legal puzzle that as they described it that exists between this legislation and other legislation so i'm directly addressing that by the contents of the code of practice and to make that as accessible as possible and the question that uh, monica lennon raised with me earlier on about the accessibility of the code of practice is absolutely fundamental to this discussion, which is why I want to make sure we get that right, which is why I'm committed, but it's why I've given an illustrative code of practice much earlier in the process than I should have done. Um, it's why I'm committed to the extensive dialogue with Parliament about it, so we can get that correct, that we can undertake the necessary pu public consultation and we can have a set of instruments that um, are clearly understandable by members of the public. <coughs> Thank you. So going back to your phrase, extensive dialogue, what do you think that means? What does that mean to you? Um, it means uh, committees looking at uh, the code of practice, having adequate time to uh, engage with relevant stakeholders on that question. It involves the government undertaking a public consultation and then having the appropriate opportunity to reflect on those issues before moving to the finalisation of the code of practice. But what it doesn't mean is Parliament being able to, you know, am amend or change uh, the code of practice at the moment. But you have said you will consider comments. It's not, uh, uh, just so we're absolutely crystal clear, it's not my proposal um, to do that. Yeah, we're clear on that. Any other members? Do confused, sorry, Cabinet Secretary, when you've gone about the code of practice, it's binding, it's obligatory on the individual, but because you're not changing the law on consent, you're not going to put it on the face of the bill, but the fact that it's so binding and obligatory, I, I don't see why you don't make the bill more clear and open to parliamentary scrutiny by putting it on the face of the bill. I still don't understand, despite hearing what you've said this morning, why you just aren't going that step further for us. Um for the very simple reason that a bill is designed to make the law, not to explain it. 
So are you telling me then that the code of practice is binding, obligatory, but it's not the law? Uh, well, if it's bind, it's it's got the force of it's got the force of statute, but the law is defined by what is in primary and secondary legislation, and the code of practice will be the requirements in the bill will require individuals to follow that code of practice. And what that code of practice does is it, is, it explains the interaction of law. It does not create new law. Well, I, th um, I understand what you're trying to say there, but I still think if it's a code of practice, it's obligatory, it's binding, it's not making new law, but it could help to surely clarify the, you know, the law that you're looking to make by putting it on the face. I think that would have exactly the opposite effect of the one that Alison Harris seeks, okay. because the law must be crystal clear. And the purpose of law is not to have a sort of wide discussion about its applicability. The purpose of law is to specify what is the law so that can be judged by the courts as to whether it's being pursued or not. The purpose of guidance uh, of, uh, and the purpose of the code of practice is to explain the interaction of different legal instruments, but to place an obligation on individuals to follow it. So it comes back to my original point that perhaps in the future teachers might need slightly more legal <laughs> teaching before no. with their... <laughs> No, because I'll address the issue that Monica Lennon raises about the accessibility of the code of practice. Well, I'm not sure we can agree on that, but never mind. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Okay. Right, at that point, uh, I will thank you uh, for your time this morning. Uh, Mr Swinney, Mr Patterson and Miss Burt. Thank you. Right, and I'll suspend the meeting briefly. Um, back in session, move on to agenda item four, um, instruments subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the draft International Organisations Immunities and Privilege Scotland Amendment Number 2, Order 2017. Is the committee content with this instrument? Okay. Agenda item five, instruments subject to negative procedure and no points have been raised uh, by our advisors on 2017, 282, 284, 285, 287 and 289. Is the committee content with these instruments? Right. Uh, agenda item six, Ireland Scotland Bill Stage 1. The purpose of this item is for the committee to consider its approach to the scrutiny of the delegated powers in the Islands Scotland Bill at stage one. Specifically, this is an opportunity to identify matters which the committee may wish to raise with the Scottish Government. The purposes of the bill are to make provision for a national islands plan to impose a duty on certain public authorities to have regard to island communities, to make provision about the electoral representation of island communities and to establish a licensing scheme in respect to marine development adjacent to islands. It suggested the committee raises questions on two of the delegated powers in the bill. Section 7.3 provides the Scottish ministers may by regulations amend the schedule which lists the bodies, office holders and other persons which are subject to the duty to have regard to island communities in carrying out their functions. However, other acts include a power to modify a list of authorities contained in the schedule by modifying an entry in the list. For example, Section 6 of the British Sign Language Scotland Act 2015, Section 8 of the Gender Representation on Public Boards Scotland Bill, presently before the Parliament, 
contains powers by regulations to modify the list of authorities in Schedule 1 so as to add an entry, vary the description of an entry or remove an entry. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government why it has been considered appropriate not to extend the power to modifying an entry in the schedule in addition to the power to add or remove an entry? Okay. In regard to the power in Section 21 to add supplementary incidental or consequential provisions to the regulations under Section 7.3 or 18, the de Delegated Powers Memorandum provides no explanation of why these powers are necessary or appropriate. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government in relation to the ancillary powers in Section 21.1a for explanation why these powers are considered to be necessary or appropriate? Uh, in particular, why are these powers appropriate in addition to the powers to make ancillary provisions by regulations in Section 22? And why is the power to add supplementary provision appropriate in respect of both regulations under Section 7.3 and Section 18? Okay. I'll now move the meeting into private.